And thank you, everyone, for coming here in Lausanne. So this is the first talk of, uh, I mean, uh, of this symposium on cell lines and around cell lines. I'm not going to describe cell lines because most of you know what it is, and you will, but you will hear about them, of course, in all of the coming talks. And here, what I will concentrate is on the cellosaurus, uh, which you could call a type of cell line encyclopedia. And maybe the first thing is, uh, this is a, probably the longest slide in terms of text, is why the cellosaurus? I mean, and it's more an historical perspective. I mean, I was not in the world of cell line. I didn't know anything about cell line except what was done in labs and so on. But I was basically working on proteins with SwissProt and then NextProt, which is a database on human protein. And of course, if you're looking at human protein or any species, you want to see where experiments are done on those protein. A lot of them are done on cell line. So you think you want to annotate where, I mean, the experiments are done. So we naively thought that we could use an existing database of cell lines and basically just say, okay, we're using uh, data accession numbers X and Y, which is cell line HeLa or whatever it is. And the problem was that basically there was no resource at that time, so in the end of 2010, which was comprehensive and had all of the cell line we needed. Even so, we needed at that point only 100 cell lines to annotate and so on. And then it went to 500, but even a tiny number of cell line compared to what exists. So we created what was a small cell line thesaurus, just a list of cell line. That's why it's called Cellosaurus, cell line thesaurus. Now, it's no longer, uh, I mean, uh, thesaurus because people became interested in that and said, oh, can you add then the cell line from ATCC, the cell line from DSMZ, the cell line from this paper, and I published the cell line. So it grew and grew, and it's no longer a thesaurus. It's an encyclopedia of cell lines. So it started in 2012, and it evolved into what is now a knowledge resource, a bio-curated, as I mean, Christoph explained, resource. And just in a visual way, you're not be able to read anything here on the next two things. Here is an entry in the first release of a mouse cell line, and you see it's only eight or ten lines. And here is the same entry in the current version. So at one point you had a, a, thesaur, a thesaurus, and in another part you have a type of more and more encyclopedic knowledge of the cell line. So in one slide, the cellosaurus, what is it? It's a knowledge resource on cell line. So on 150,000, it's a new version coming up in a few weeks. We'll have 151,000 cell lines. So we went far from 100 cell lines we needed to annotate to 150,000. And the scope is all immortalized or naturally immortal uh, or finite cell lines, but which are well characterized, but not primary cells. And it covers all vertebrate and invertebrate cell lines. Now, so it's about you now 50 different feet. I'm not going to you know, bore you with all the different fields of information. I would just show at one point an entry and maybe point them, but it's basically 50 different type of information items and a lot of reference. That's important, of course, to say where the data comes from and cross reference to a huge number of resource, external resource, which either use a cell line, provide information on cell line, or very importantly, distribute a cell line, cell line collection. And we'll have a talk, I mean, during this symposium by one representative of a cell line collection. So you will hear about it. Now, availability of uh, Cellosaurus, you can just Google and find it, but it's www.cellosaurus.org. It's downloadable in different type of formats. There is now for programmers an API. Most of you are probably not really interested in programmatic sites, so I'm not going to describe the API, I mean. So basically, it's a resource available on the web, and you can download it if you want to have it in us. Now, it's part of, and this is our talk again, and of, so there will be a talk by Anita later, I mean today, of the Resource Identification Initiative, and we come back to that, and of the International Cell Line Authentication Committee, and also you will hear about that, I mean, uh, with, uh, I mean, Amanda, I mean, also during today. And we collaborate with the Human Pluripotent Stem Cell Registry, Andreas Kurtz, which is here. So basically, this is not only a presentation of the cells, but it also presents, you know, who is going to speak 
and what will be some of the subjects of this, I mean, of some of those talks, and many other resources, cell line resource and collection. It's, I mean, being recognized in the field of, bio, of uh, database of bioresource. So there are different organizations trying to see which resource are, seem to be the most, I mean, useful one and important one. Elixir in Europe, and uh, so the is a core data resource. And just recently, uh, last month, the global core biodata resource. So it's a global effort to find which resource should be globally are interested worldwide, interesting worldwide, as put the cellulosaurus on its list. It's an EODIC recognized resource. This is for rare disease research. Anyway, you have to enter data into cellulosaurus. Again, I'm not going to describe all the different fields, but what, or does this data, where does this data come from, or, and how does it get into cellulosaurus? Well, there's four channels. It's extracting data from cell line collection. So selling cell line, distributing cell line, and they generally provide a relatively, I mean, good amount of information on each cell line they distribute. I mean, unfortunately, this is not easily automated. None of the cell line collection really has, you know, a way of downloading the data and so that it can be programmatically, I mean, extracted. To my knowledge, I've never seen uh, cell line collection which allows this. So you, you have different strategy, but it's slow and tedious. Then you want to also extract data from other resource, bioinformatic resource, which have specific data field which could be interesting because experiments were done on the cell line and capture into bioinformatic resource. So that's much easier because generally those resource being in the field of bioinformatics, know already about standardization, about protocols, about, so there are generally APIs, there are different ways you can download data and so on. And you can get information like sequence variation, HLE typing and so on. But the biggest effort is basically taking papers, up to 27,000 now of them, read them. Of course, not all of the paper, because if you're only interested in cell line and the paper describe other things, it will be only part of it, but sometimes it will be the whole paper and extract what's useful for cellulosaurus. So that's the biggest task, and it's the most time consuming by definition. And now submission and personal communication is also a way to get information, and this is something which is increasingly becoming, I mean, uh, getting bigger and bigger, and that's a message, a take-home message for the audience working with cell line, don't hesitate to send information on a new cell line or a cell line which you think is not well characterized and there is information missing. I mean, send information, I mean, it's always going to be useful and you'll be thanked for it and we'll be, of course, your reference, your paper will be included, but also if you, it's personal communication, we will cite you as a personal, I mean, as personal communication. No, I was saying the database is linked to a lot of resource. You see just here a little bit of logos, uh, a big set of logos, but it's not all of them. Here is only, I think, 60 of those 107, which is linked. And you will recognize cell lines, collection, ATCC, DSMZ, but also bioinformatic resource, companies, and so on. So availability, I already said it, it's on the website. There is an API, but just Recapitex here. You can download it in three formats for a moment. And that's where you can get it by FTP. So four release per year. I mean, so not with a very uh, precise date in a year, but since it started, it's four per year. And it's distributed in a Creative Common uh, CC by 4.0, meaning basically that you can use it, redistribute it, and uh, everyone can do it, whether in academics or in, uh, of course, in industry. Uh, that's just a website uh, homepage. And uh, basically, when you go to an entry, you have a lot of information. And I'm not going to go through all of this, but you can basically just recognize sets of information, comments, like sequence variation. You see names of genes and variations and linked to database like the ClinVar, which is a database of variants in human. You see information on cancer, which are linked to control vocabulary of disease. I mean, Orphanet and NCI Tesaurus species linked to the NCBI taxonomy. Uh, and I'm in phasing these links because in this world, interconnected world, 
what's important is to link, I mean, with different resources, link to controls, vocabulary, or to ontologies. Ontology of disease, ontology of, and control vocabulary of species, and so on. A lot of, I mean, table type information, like HLA typing, I mean, genome ancestry for some cell line. And very importantly, and I will come back to it, what we call in the world of cell line STR profile. This will be covered really a lot today because, in fact, that's one of the big issues in cell line reproducibility. So I will speak about it. Amanda will speak about it. Jamie will speak about it. You will hear. I mean, I'm sure all of the talks will have a little bit on this. But it's important to get this message across about authentication. A reference, only part of all the reference here, and cross-reference. Where can you get the cell lines, the providers, important, and but also also resource, which there is information on those cell lines, whether it's, I mean, uh, proteomics data sets, sequence database, and so on. Okay, now let's get to problem with cell line and some of the solution which will be described. I mean, so I'm not saying here of problems in terms of I mean, growing them and so on. I mean, this you are also hearing about, but more in terms of some things in terms of reproducibility of science. So one of it is naming issue because people often give short names. And this is a disaster. Here is 10 names for 37 different cell lines. And of course, you can realize that if you call something C2, it's not going to be very, I mean, precise. Even, I, I'm not saying even in a full world of all of the things, genes and so on, even in cell line, it's going to be already four or five. And of course, it will be a gene name uh, and so on. So basically, short names are a problem. And of course, you can you try to make longer names, but people will be very, I mean, good at abbreviating them. And uh, so, of course, somebody called FG3, G2 slash C3A, oh, I'm going to call it C3A. Now, there are only two nomenclature rules which have been proposed, one on insect cell line in the 70s, which is not really used a lot, and one which is quite important for all of the stem cell and pluripotent stem cell, and Andreas will probably speak about that, which is used quite a lot. And of course, there is a huge number of misspellings. But of course, stem cells, it's quite important that they have this nomenclature, but all of the rest, cancer cells, everything else, so there is no nomenclature whatsoever. So, of course, instead of using the name, you could use an identifier, and that's where Anita will describe, and I'm not going to describe this, I mean, initiative, but just in two words, because it's important to say, it's basically, you want to have persistent, unique identifier in the literature for resource that you have used in an experiment, whether it's antibody, cell line, software, strain, and then, basically, what's important here in, in the context of Cellosaurus, the Cellosaurus is cell line resource for this initiative. And basically, the ID for cell line are the accessions of a cell line entry in Cellosaurus. So you don't need to have two different interfere, you have one interfere. And here is what it looks like in a paper, in, an abs in a method part of a paper. Somebody have used Ray 2647, which is cell line I showed, which went from a few lines to that and the site, air ID, with succession of uh, it. And you see here that they're citing four different cell lines, with also usefully the catalog number, where they got it sometime, like ATC. Well, they didn't put the catalog here, but they say where it came from. But at least wherever it is, you can find what that cell line is by going back to the database. And there is more and more papers which cite this, and Snell reached, I mean, it started in 2000, not the initiative, but the cellos joining it was in late 2016, beginning of 2017, and you see that it's increasing, which is quite useful because you have then papers where you know which the lamps have used. Now, the other big issue, which will be described, I mean, during this uh, I mean, uh, symposium quite a lot, is cell contamination. And it's a huge problem. And here is just titles of papers. Basically, it's the dirty little secret of cancer research, wasting a lot of research funding. Oops. 
and so on, and with estimation that the extent of, for cancer cell line of contamination goes from 20 to 36 percent. Now, that means that, I mean, when I need to check about the cell line integrity, and I here I have a few definition, which I, this will be redundant to other talks, but I think we need to, I mean, get those points over and over. I mean, contaminated cell line can arise through the accidental introduction of a foreign cell line, which be, is sometimes called cross-contamination, or, of course, from microorganisms. This is less an issue because people recognize this, see that there are cell line is contaminated with mycoplasma. What we really are talking, which is really the problem, is cross-contamination, where the cell line you're using is not the one you think you really... Uh, so when you think you're using is not the one you're using. And you can have also misidentified cell line, which are, I mean, a result of error in species or gender. People telling you this is a cell line from a male organism, but no, it was taken from a female organism. Or it's, this is a bovine cell line. No, sorry, it's a pig cell line. But, and this happens. I mean, you would think people know where they got the cell lines from and where they originated, but errors happen. And in fish world, I mean, uh, this happened also a few cases, also in terms of taxonomic, uh, I mean, people not putting the right name for fish or just saying salmon without saying which salmon it is and so on. And of course, you have misclassified cell line where the tissue type is not correct, the cell type, or even the disease. People thought it was from a given disease, and no, it was not that disease. Anyway, here is three papers with three different types of those uh, examples. One is uh, a classical cross-contamination where a bladder, bladder cancer cell line, it's not a bladder cancer cell line, it's ILA. And another case where one monkey cell line is not really from the monkey people thought it was. I mean, uh, so BSC1 is not derived from Cercoptes etiops, but from another monkey. And another case where one thought this was a semino mass cell line, but it's from a different cancer type and so on. So all problems case, because if you publish thinking of what model you're using and it's not the right model, it can completely invalidate what you're doing. I mean, so also a problem case. Fortunately, there was a work started already a number of years ago with, I mean, number of scientists, all of them doing this pro bono. Basically, none of them is paid to do this. I mean, those are scientists which are passionate in getting those cell line, I mean, correct. And they have created uh, committees, the International Cell Line Notification Committee, and we have here both the first chairman and the current chairman, I mean, uh, I mean uh, Amanda and Anita, which basically provide a list of misidentified cell line registry, and you will hear about that. And of course, the cellosaurus uses this information and tells people this cell line is inside the registry, has this problem, and so on. Now, so we annotate this. We use, I'm not going to go into the detail of how we do it, but we have field called problematic cell line. I here give examples, but let's not go into the details. I, for me, what's important to remember is if in cellosaurus cell line is known to have a problem, you will see it, and it will be in big red letters, and it will be shown that it's problematic. And we also do it for cell line which has a descendant of a cell line which is itself contaminated, because sometimes that's also a little bit of a hidden problem, which is, I mean, maybe sometimes overlooked. People know, okay, this cell line is contaminated, but some people have created new cell line from this cell line before it was known to be contaminated. So you have a whole family a hierarchy of cell lines which are wrong because, I mean, they all are descendants of one which is not the correct thing. So for that, people use in the cell line world, and most of you know it, but I will do one slide knowing that this will be probably covered later, what are called short tandem repeats, loci in a genome which are polymorphic and which can be used. I mean, it started with the human genome. We'll see it's not only human now. But basically, those were used also for forensic, for paternity, and so on. And basically, I mean, they're also used to ensure the quality and integrity of human cell line. And there was a standard published in 2011, which was updated in 10 years later in 2021, which the low side people should use to report, I mean, uh, integrity of cell line. It's not, it's very useful. It's not all of it. And uh, Willie will speak uh, today, I mean, on things that could look good 
from a point of view of stereo profile, but still you can have problems. So as stereo profile, you have to use them, but it doesn't mean you have a, you know, a clean bill of health and that you're safe. You could be sometimes still have surprise. And of course, pioneers were now developed for other species, for mouse and dog, and mouse we have here, I mean, the person which was responsible for the most uh, STR marker panels. Now, we have those profile in Celosaurus, so that's an important part of what we store. And we have, out of 150,000, we have, you could say it's only 1,600, I said it's already 1,800, sorry, uh, uh, cells. You have to see that this project is really prevalent for cancer cell line, and the Celosaurus has a lot of other uh, cell line where the problem of contamination is a little bit less prevalent. So we see this as increasing, and we tell people, if you authenticate your cell line, and you, uh, because the journal or, or you think rightly that you should do it, don't hesitate to send us, I mean, those profile and to integrate in Celsius. And we say, we give all of the different sources of where those SDR profile comes with conflicts if there are different sources give different results, which can be due to errors or to genetic drift, loss, or gain of an allele. And again, we'll hear about that today. And we have a tool for that. So Cellosaurus is the database, but it has a number of tools. One of it is API, which is for programmer, but one is for you as a life scientist using Cellline. If you have a similar, done an STR, I mean, uh, on a Cellline, you can search against all of them in uh, Cellosaurus with either human mouse and dog markers. Uh, I'm not going to go into all details. There are three different algorithms you can use. I would say if you're not a specialist uh, on it, just use a default algorithm. I mean, and uh, you can also, if you have many samples in industry, I mean, that's relatively the case. I mean, you just input all your sample in one batch, and there is an API. And it's very fast. It has an interface. You can either load a file or put your profile and then it will report to you. And in red, I mean, if you have a score and you see that it's 100% identical to something in red, danger. It means that you basically, I mean, are hitting a cell line which is contaminated. Or even if it's, this is in fact a cell line already known to be contaminated. Or, and it, but if you have something which is 100% or 95 or 99%, to things which are not, I mean, annotated as contaminated, but it's not your cell line, it means you have a problem, but you may be the first one to encounter this, that you found out that your cell line is not what you thought, but is one of the cell line, the cell line which the best hit. So always authenticate, try to authenticate your cell line. Of course, you can click and see what's your cell line and get back to cell service about it. Now, that will be my last three slides. I mean, we want to add things to Stellosaurus constantly. I'm not going to do a list of all the things. We had two days of a scientific advisory meetings where we discussed this, and uh, most of the people, I mean, the giving talks to this meeting were in this scientific advisory meeting we had for those two days here in Lausanne. And, but one of the things in terms of tools that we want to do is that we have a new full text search which will I mean, include in it what is in the API so that people can do field search, so that you can not just type something and do a full text, but you can restrict the search to all the different fields. And for, and this I would say is mostly for people in industry, which are really using it a lot, not really bench scientists. We want to have an RDF version to make the Celosaurus, I mean, compatible with what is called the semantic web and the integration in terms of resource in a seamless way using what is called triple stores. Not going to describe this. People in the industry have probably heard so much about it that they're fed up of hearing about RDF and Sparkle. People in life science, you don't really need to know about that. I mean, what we will have at one point a Sparkle query system, but we will try to hide it behind something where you can do uh, queries which are much more friendly than a Sparkle query where you need more or less to have really knowledge of the resource to do. An alerting system for newly discovered contamination and but in terms of content, one thing which we felt and people really told us was important is information on susceptibility of cell line 
to virus. Think of the COVID pandemic. At the beginning, it was really a mess to know which, or it was a mess in general, but in terms of the research, what cell line could be used to grow SARS-CoV-2 and so on, and immediately people tried. Immediately there were, I mean, uh, I mean, papers and reprints and so on. So here for that, we even did wait four months to do a release. We put a page which is still maintained. I mean, to tell people you can use this cell line, you can use this cell line, and so on. Here is the reprints. But the thing is, yes, SARS-CoV-2 was an emergency and people had to do, but now we have to be prepared to all of the different type of emerging virus. And then it's useful to know what are cell models you can use which already exist, or maybe no cell models have been developed for this particular virus, and that's also important to know. And we're also maybe going to annotate distributed organoid, but we have to wait to see where this field is going. And uh, that's more a structural point, I mean, more for people linking to cell other disorder resource. I mean, uh, Christoph showed, you can see the age of the person from which the cell line was obtained. It was ELA, 30 year and six months. I mean, yes, that's useful for scientists. You read 30 year and six months, you know what it is. A computer, okay, well, now with uh, AI, I mean, can translate this, but people want more what is uh, uh, linked to a developmental ontology, which tells, you know, 30 years is this, and, uh, and then can do computation on it. You can say then, give me also cell line from teenager, give me cell line from people which are, I mean, uh, between 20 and 40 and so on, and this in different species. So we're going to add this. With this last two slides, I want to thank a number of people which are listed here. Pierre-André Michel, who is in fact in the audience here and who is, I mean, going to, he's at the back because he's going to do, I mean, help people asking questions by giving you a mic. So that's an explanation already for my talk and also talks. Don't short questions because we're taping those talks for a later date to put, if everything is, goes well with the captation, you never know with, I mean, uh, in advance if things are okay. So as the talks are taped, the question also, but only if you speak in the mic. So raise your hand for questions and it will come. This is for every talk you're going to have today. And basically, Elizabeth Gasteiger, which implemented Celosaurus on Expasi, Cami, which created a number of educational videos, and people which are here as speakers, and she organized all of this symposium. You see a number of other names, Thibault, which did the cluster tool, Alain Gatto, Lilia, and some people which are here in this audience, Amanda of ICLAC, which has given so many advice on the... Uh, to get the Celosaurus evolved, so I think she's an uh, external user with the most input on what the Celosaurus became, so very uh, big, thank you, Amanda. And all of the individual scientists. And last slide, so you can email, I mean, uh, to this email address, you don't need to copy it or things like that, it also any page on top, it says contact, click on contact, there is a contact form, and type whatever you want, whether new data, graphs that things are not okay, or you know, whatever you want, but do that, contact us. And for news on what's on the cell line, we have a Twitter and no, X account, and a Mastodon account, and, uh, but uh, uh, we also, so basically you, this you can also follow to see what is new, but you can get on the website to see if there's a new version and so on, but people, some people like to follow it on Twitter or Mastodon. Okay, with this, I finish my talk and we have time, I think, for a few questions. Um, Thank you, Amos, for a very instructive and enlightening talk. I have just one quick question on cell strains which are used in vaccine production like uh, Vista 38 yeah. and MRC5. They are not transformed, they are not primary cell in a narrow sense, yeah. but they are widely used in the industry. Are they inside oh, of yeah, the of system? Uh, when I said it, it's immortalized cell or finite cell line when they're well characterized. And so it's like, I mean, a very good example of well characterized finite cell line I mean, MRC5, WA38, and all of those. All of the fibroblasts from Coriel for genetic disease. So we have a lot of 
finite cell as long as it is characterized, I mean, in a, with a, or without a Lestra profile sometimes, but at least that's our, you know, publications, that's a, it's maintained by an organization distributed in the case of MRC5 and WA38, so there's at least 10 cell line collection which we distributed and so on. Even so, it's finite. Just another comment. I was taught by Len Hayflick to be very clear about terminology. The terminology for lines is immortalized cells and strains is for none. So he was very adamant of saying, so WISTA 38, which was the one he created, was not a cell line, but it's a cell strain. So I completely agree from an historical perspective, but if you look in Medline, since the 1970s, 80s, there's been only three or four papers where people call this cell strain. So trying to force on a nomenclature which is not used in the last 40 years or 50 years seems like a type of uh, battle you cannot win. So in every cell collection, they're called cell line. In every paper, they're called cell line. Yes, you're right. They should have been called cell strain, but this didn't catch up. So let's be uh, realistic. It's, these are finite cell lines. And uh, AKA cell strain. <laughs> I think... Uh, Hi, um, I'm Constantina Falida, and I'm a scientific editor at the International Journal of Cancer. We are using Cellosaurus every day, and I'm very grateful that it exists. I would like to know, um, why have you decided not to include primary cells? Is this something that you would consider in the future? Well, no, I mean, there's a fact about that on the web page, so you can look at it, but I was <laughs> explaining what it says on fact. The problem is primary cells are sold by different places, are not, I mean, uniquely defined. They basically replenish them often with different people, I mean, uh, individuals being the donor. Sometimes they try to keep that it's same sex and same, of course, if it's, uh, I mean, uh, same tissue or things like that, but it's not a product which you can say that an experiment done, you know, eight years ago with a primary cell from XYZ is the same as an experiment done now. So it doesn't have, you know, uh, defined cellular entity, it's not being cloned, it's not being, it goes, it's finite, which is not a problem to go back to the last question, but it's not well defined and so on. So if somebody did do a primary cell and since it would, uh, which would, and then stops the catalog when it's over and things like that, you could say, yes, we could say, this becomes like a type of cell line which was distributed for a while and now they don't distribute anymore. But most of the, Primary cell you can get now from different industries. They change lots, and uh, from one lot to another one, you would have to define it. So we would have to capture the lot number, and it's a mess if you go to those different uh, companies. I mean, they, they give you a lot number, but they don't tell you if this new lot number is really from the same person or not. I mean, this information is rarely present. 